All right, so tonight we have uh, Natalie Jeremijenko with us, and um, I just want to give a very brief introduction before she starts. Natalie is uh, one of the most influential women in technology in 2011 and one of the inaugural top young innovators by MIT Technology Review. She directs the Environmental Health Clinic and is an associate professor, professor in the Visual Art Department at NYU. And she's affiliated with the Computer Science Department and Environmental Studies Program. Previously, she was on the Visual Arts faculty at UCSD and faculty of engineering at Yale University. And uh, most recently, she's a visiting professor at the Royal College of Art in London and a distinguished visiting professor in the public understanding of science at Michigan State University. She has degrees in biochemistry and engineering, in neuroscience, and in history and philosophy of science. Um, tonight, Natalie is going to be talking to us about how to um, get closer towards a healthy urban environment. So please uh, join me in welcoming Natalie. Uh, it really is a great pleasure to be here, and I feel like this uh, rousing crowd behind us is, is amplifying that um, idea um, on this very, very cold. Um, I don't, it was meltingly hot yesterday in New York City, <laughs> and now to be here freezing is a, um, is a wake-up call. So I'm here actually to talk to you about the kind of wake-up call that we are all facing, of what to do, uh, what I call the crisis of agency that we face. And I think the climate crisis has revealed a, m a much more insidious crisis, this crisis of agency. What do we do individually, institutionally, collectively? How do we reimagine and redesign our relationship to natural systems? We know we need to, but what do we do? So that's the question that I've actually been pondering, pondering um, and have actually set up my lab and framed my work um, in uh, to answer that. So if you will, um, I'm twisting the definition of health to uh, include the environment. So I treat environmental issues as health issues and health issues as environmental issues. In order to reframe environmental issues as immediate and, and you know, against the kind of globalized discourse of environmentalism, global warming, for instance, uh, we can, by definition, do nothing about global warming as an individual, as a small group, as an institution. Um, so this globalized discourse has had a very um, unfortunate consequence of, uh, you know, making environmental issues not local enough to be actionable. And I would argue that, of course, we can only act um, locally. So I've set up my lab and clinic as the environmental health clinic, um, again, to, um, you know, twist the definition of health into something we can act on and use. So the, the health clinic um, operates like another, any other health clinic at a university. People come to the clinic um, and uh, people who come to the clinic are not called patients, they're called impatients because they're too impatient to wait for legislative change to address these environmental issues. And uh, instead of <clears throat> getting a prescription for pharmaceuticals, they walk out with uh, prescriptions for things they can do to actually improve measurably their local environmental health. And the big issue with this is that, um, uh, well, there's a lot of big issues. I'm not the only one. Of course, there's many people who uh, have made this argument and this reframing. Um, in, I was at an environmental health conference last week where the an opening statement was, where you live matters more than your genetics in determining your health outcomes. Um, Philip Landrigan is another um, person who's worked very hard on this, at Mount Sinai. This is one of his um, articles that I find particularly compelling. If we think of our children as canaries, which is uh, probably not, anyway, pediatricians in, um, who were surveyed in this paper to, and asked what they did with their time uh, monitored for how they actually spent their time with children, um, their patients, right? And about 80 to 90% of their time was um, accounted for by five top issues. The first one, can you guess? Number one that they spend most of their time on? Asthma. Number two, 
developmental delays, the broad spectrum of ADD, ADHD, uh, all sorts of speech and gross motor issues, uh, developmental issues. Um, number three, surprisingly, is um, rare childhood cancers, which take up an enormous amount of time. We've seen a 400-fold increase in rare childhood cancers in the last uh, 15 years. Um, and number five and six, uh, diabetes, you know, um, juvenile diabetes and uh, the obesity epidemic. Six-month-olds with obesity issues, right? Um, so this is what takes up, this is what pediatricians are doing. Of course, they're not, they're trained in the germ theory of health. This is not what um, they're equipped to deal with. But what is common about those top five things? The environment is implicated. The environment is um, determining how we live. It determines our health. And so kind of reframing this, um, the environmental health clinic and the work in, in this way, um, I found useful. One other thing I'll point to, um, anything you do to improve your environmental health, um, <clears throat> to improve your own air quality or water quality, your own environmental health, the benefits, unlike you know, taking a nutraceutical or a pharmaceutical, the benefits are enjoyed by anyone you share that air quality or water quality or environment with, right? The collective benefit of this frame, framing of health aggregates into something that we all share, the shared environmental commons. So um, an, another um, <clears throat> way to understand our shared environmental commons is actually from a non-human perspective. So I work and collaborate and conspire a lot with our non-human cohabitants. Um, and actually this is, I think, a good illustration of a, um, a peculiar study that David Allison did just to look for the obesity epidemic in the 38 species of animals that he could get data on that cohabit with us. So these are coyote in Central Park um, and wild, um, uh, you know, um, wild coyote, lab animals, pets, um, wild dogs, anything, squirrels, um, uh, feral rats, um, these 38 species that he was able to get good data on to see if the obesity epidemic was evident in any of these cohabiting species. Can you guess how many of these species demonstrated the obesity epidemic? All of them, all 38 species. The only thing they're doing is sharing the, our environment, right? Um, and so this, this idea that it's just about our waistline and our um, diet and not about these larger complex socio-ecological systems is um, put to lie. So um, actually turning to our non-humans to help to understand the irreducible complexity of, the, of these socio-ecological systems is something that um, I would recommend and have learned a great deal from. This is a um, project that was in the Whitney Biennial uh, two or three ago um, called a perch. It was commu it's communication technologies for birds, right? They haven't had the cell phone revolution, um, so it's a little catch up. Uh, it's a, it, looks, it, it is what it looks like, a perch. The, um, the birds land on it, and when they land on it, it triggers a sound file that um, plays out the back, um, out the bottom that you can see. Uh, it would play something like this. Now here's what you need to do. Go down there and buy some of those health food bars, the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. Okay, so that's um, uh, actually in the... Um, this is set up in a number of places, but the, in the sculpture court of the Whitney Museum, we had six of these perches set up. Um, each of them had a different argument about why we might consider sharing nutritional resources. Um, one was to do with copyright dues for all the melodic resources borrowed from birds for <laughs> cell phone ringtones, etc. Um, but by far the most popular, about eight to one, the one that the birds, you know, literally they were experimenting on people, right? Which one did they favor? Eight to one was this this one. Tick, tick, tick. That's the sound of genetic mutations, of the avian flu becoming a deadly human flu. Do you know what slows it down? Healthy subpopulations of birds, increasing biodiversity generally. It is in your interests that I am healthy, happy, 
well fed. Hence, you could share some of your nutritional resources instead of monopolizing them. That is, share your lunch. Biology 101 from the pigeons. It uh, illustrates, of course, the dynamic that we, uh, our industrialized food uh, systems have produced a pathogenicity, both in swine flu and in avian flu, associated, you would have probably know that all of the wild birds that were identified positively with uh, avian flu were found within a 15 kilometer radius of an industrialized farming, chicken farming um, facility. Um, but this idea that, uh, that the way that we produce our food is uh, problematic, right? That it, it, uh, it in, it's a perfect cauldron for pathogenicity, right? We've you know, reduced the light, so there's the UV sterilization. We've got many genetically similar organisms living in close proximity under high stress They're with suppressed immune systems. The, in, a, in a wild context, if you have a pathogenic bug, it, if it kills too quickly, it, it won't you know, be distributed, it won't. Uh, so it's, there's natural limits, but in these cauldrons of pathogenicity, as they call them, we, um, we have created the perfect conditions. And we can and must reimagine how we do um, this. So again, turning to um, non-humans, uh, this is a project called Amphibious Architecture. I did in collaboration with the living architects. Um, and it's a series of buoys that float, uh, in this case, on the East River and in the Bronx River. Um, and you can see from that little animation that what happens is as the fish swim underneath, uh, the buoy lights up, right? So the fish, it's a low resolution display of fish presence um, where the, uh, the fish leave a trail of lights. Um, so here we were just deploying them in the East River. Um, and here they are, um, of course. Actually, as they were implemented, they had um, a top always on light which uh, shifted from a warm red color when dissolved oxygen, when water quality was low, to a cool blue-green color when water quality was uh, better. Um, and then, of course, the bottom light, layer of lights um, uh, triggered on when fish were near. And of course, um, the first question people ask is, well, are there fish in the East River? Right? People. Everyone asks that, right? It's, of course, their, uh, their presence, uh, the, uh, the idea that the river is more than a pretty reflective surface, the view of which greatly enhances your real estate value, but is in fact a teeming body, a habitat, um, is, um, is in question. So are there fish in the East River? Let's have a look. Um, if you look, have a look in the front row here. Ah, there's one. You can see coming, going across the front. And then a couple more at the back. Yes, there are fish in the East River. So not only could you see that they were there, you could also communicate with the fish, right? Um, on, down on the site, at the, um, there was business cards with the contact details for the organisms that were likely to be there. So you could text the fish, and they would then text you back, right? Um, and this was actually... Um, uh, as, as skeptical as, as the, um, the seven city, state, and federal agencies were um, enormously popular for people to text the fish. Um, we had over 700 people uh, subscribing for daily updates from the beaver, uh, Jose the beaver, who's the first beaver to move into New York City. He's, um, uh, he was actually at that point um, alone and like um, about two million other desperate single males in New York City, he was a little sleazy, right? He was always desperately asking people, you know, uh, are you up for a cross-species adventure? I'll show you my lodge, right? So um, he was an interesting character. And all of the organisms, the scups, the, um, the bay anchovies, the tom cod, all had interesting characters that were informed by the water quality indicators, the behavioral models, and the actual observed um, interpretations of uh, their urban lifestyles. But um, actually, the update on Jose the beaver, um, he's got a partner, 
a male partner uh, and a happy, steady homosexual relationship with um, Justin Beaver, who's uh, <laughs> appeared. And um, <clears throat> they're living happily ever after, recolonizing this. But um, so not only could you t uh, see, the, you know, the the presence of these other organisms, um, and start to explore their life, um, start to communicate with them, but you could also feed them. Um, so we developed a because uh, what happens wherever you see non-humans in an urban context. There's usually a sign in New York City parks. There's about three signs, and every even a little tiny park. Do not feed the animals. And you've got to ask, why not feed the animals? Why should we monopolize all these nutritional resources? And of course, the received answer is, well, you know, uh, in zoos, for instance, you know, human food is not good for them. Um, yes, uh, it's good enough for humans, but it's not good enough for animals. Um, interesting, you know, this great sparrow decimation is a... Uh, in London and New York, we've had about a 90% um, decimation in the um, sparrow population. Um, and the most likely explanation of, for that is the androgenic diet. Um, so yes, human food is not good for, <laughs> for the, uh, the animals. But, um, but the, uh, the other idea is that you know, you're going to interfere with the animals if you feed them, which uh, you know, on your drive to a national park, Yellowstone National Park, for instance, as you're driving along the freeway that cuts off the migration route for those animals. As we're changing the entire global climate, um, you know, we worry when we're offering food. You know, that we're in Yes, we're interfering with them, right? And the idea is that our, do we have the agency or the capacity to, to make that productive or good? So I would argue we would. Lures, um, were the, f the food that we developed. These are based on gelin, which is an algae extract. It's nutritionally appropriate. So instead of offering the, the um, fish, you can imagine a busload full of kids um, turning up to the amphibious architecture array, throwing you know, Doritos or chewing gum or cigarette butts, whatever they have to hand. Um, in this case, we give them lures, which are um, cast into commercial fishing lures with this gelin, which is nutritionally appropriate, right? The hook is, there is no hook, right? Um, the idea is that by augmenting the nutritional resources that we ourselves have depleted, we augment the fish populations. And furthermore, in the lures, we've put in a chelating agent, uh, a medical grade chelating agent, well used in both water treatment facilities and in, in hospitals for people with mercury um, uh, poisoning. Um, this chelating agent is a, um, a biopolymer derived from chitin, and when the fish ingest it, it binds to their bioaccumulated heavy metals complexes and passes out as a salt, where it settles down into the silt and is effectively removed from bioavailability. Right. So this is in a systems approach. It's a targeted drug delivery approach, as opposed to. Um, <coughs> What they're doing, I don't know if you know, in the Hudson River, it's taken them over 30 years and much legal and legislative wrangling to get GE to clean up the biggest Superfund site in the country, which is um, the PCBs in the Hudson River. And so they're dredging um, particular spots um, that have, that is, they're resuspending all the toxic sludge that has had about seven centimeters of of silt actually settle over it and make it actually remove it from the food web and um, then shipping it off to you know Pennsylvania or the nearest third world country where it continues to be toxic sludge right so that's the opposite approach right this kind of displacement idea of dealing with environmental issues Pennsylvania right <laughs> um, or uh, or can we figure out how to in this case, when we're feeding it to the fish, which is where it's bioaccumulated, right, where it's most concentrated, right, in the system and treating it there, um, what we're doing is changing this idea that, you know, feeding the animals is bad, that every th all interactions um, that between the public and animals needs to, need to be contained and controlled and glass walls and fences and signs um, put up. And actually, the idea that we can... We have the agency to design those interactions to be productive, to change those 
interactions into collective action, collective remediative action that can have significant effect, <laughs> significant um, environmental improvements in fish health. And of course the number one source of mercury in our bodies is from fish. By treating fish and by treating fish as health, the health of fish, we're treating our own health right? um, collectively and I would argue um, effectively. Um, so <clears throat> this is so taken this project on towards uh, a fish restaurant where you feed fish rather than eat them um, and it's in development and in fact the launch of the Cross Species Adventure Club to which I invite you all <laughs> to become members. The Cross Species Adventure Club is a, gas, um, a molecular gastronomy supper club where we explore food and food systems that improve environmental health and augment biodiversity um, and are delicious. A couple of other examples here um, that I'll... Murkish Delight, Lou as you saw, Viva La Vidim. Um, I'm sorry, one of them. Uh, <coughs> let me give you the, the Viva Levitum is a, um, there's a, there's another, uh, there's another edible cocktail that we served. Um, oh, I have, I'm very bad with royals. Um, we served a prince, the Prince of Sweden, Prince Frederick, right? Is that him? He married an Australian who the Australians love. So, Danish, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so actually, um, there's another an, another cocktail called um, that goes with the Viva La Vida one um, called uh, Wet Kisses, the um, um, a marshmallow for kissing a frog, formerly known as Prince. And so it's nice to have the Prince eat this. And let me explain to you, Viva La Vida is a um, uh, you know we are currently witnesses to the greatest species extinction crisis since the dinosaurs. We're mere spectators to the l tremendous loss of amphibians. And um, one of the things, the biggest culprit in, in that, uh, you know, multi... Well, what's causing that is um, not only habitat loss, but this deadly fungus, the chytrid fungus that you may have heard of. Um, the chytrid fungus, actually, interestingly, the the the... Frogs and amphibians that survive when the chytrid fungus moves through a watershed are those that have on their microbial skin community um, a little bug called um, J. levitum. Um, and they have, when they have a healthy um, colony of that in their skin, they seem to be able to resist the, the um, chytrid fungus, which changes the osmotic pressure, basically gives them a massive cardiac arrest, and that you see frog ponds full with frogs floating belly up, right? This extremely uh, deadly um, fungal um, invasion. So, um, so what we've done is taken Viva La Vidim, um, f in this case, that's the cross-species cross-dressing, and augmented it into various cocktails, Viva La Vidim and the Wet Kiss, the marshmallow, of course, for rediscovering the marsh in marshmallows, um, to... Uh, the wet kiss for kissing the frog, formerly known as Prince. When you bite into the cocktail, your lips are inoculated with levitum, J. levitum. So you're equipped to kiss a frog and protect it from the deadly chytrid fungus, right? Um, with this bio-augmentation strategy. And of course, the idea that we can produce um, this beneficial bacteria that we like so much. Um, nano water buffalo ice cream is another example um, we serve at the, the um, <coughs> Cross Species Adventure Club uh, suppers that uh, is truly... Uh, anyone had buffalo ricotta? You know it's the best ricotta, right? The Romans knew that water buffalo ricotta, water buffalo milk, was far creamier and higher fat content, higher protein content than dairy cows, right? Um, by, so by creating a nano water buffalo ice cream, it's nano because it's, we use liquid nitrogen and create nano-sized crystals to emphasize that smooth creaminess of the ice cream. Um, <coughs> by creating the demand for this delicious ice cream, we create the demand for water buffalo. Water buffalo, of course, demand 
wetlands. Wetlands, the most critical ecosystems for sequestering carbon, these for recharging aquifers, for degrading many, the only technology we have for degrading, digesting many of the industrial contaminants, for protest, protecting the terrestrial ecosystem, right, the loss of nitrogen, um, the, from protecting the aquatic ecosystem from the nitrification, um, from so it's sort of nurseries for many aquatic organisms. Wetlands are these critical ecosystems that we continue, we are continually losing. Um, so by creating the demand for, uh, we actually have this project with Ben and Jerry's ice cream, which was recently launched in Europe. Um, ben and Jerry's, some of the um, Vermont-based dairy farmers, have, we've been talking to them about introducing uh, water buffalo because the low-grade farmland uh, where they can construct and extend wetlands to capture the runoff from the spray fields used in dairy farms, right? So preventing it from entering the um, aquatic ecosystem. What we're doing is creating a system, we're creating a delicious ice cream that uh, for the dairy farmers means they have increased productivity um, and radically increased environmental performance, right? So I examples of the delicious um, and nutritious foods that we're exploring at the Cross Species Adventure Club, which, um, uh, soccer clubs are illegal. I mean, that's basically it. And yeah, um, so um, what we do is uh, the invitations, uh, we ask you to scan them with your phone, um, read them, and then ingest them, <laughs> right? Um, uh, and of course here, printing onto a edible rice paper, we um, explore how we might use ephemeral materials for ephemeral purposes instead of durable materials that last for decades in marine contexts and end up in the middle of the Pacific. Um, so these kinds of explorations for adventurous eating, oh, this is actually another one that is coming up with, uh, that we're just actually doing, this is called FLOSS, for, which many of you know is used to stand for Free Libra Open Source Systems. Um, in this case, it stands for FLOSS, Fairy FLOSS is what we call it in Australia, or Cotton FLOSS is what they call it in the UK, or Cotton Candy is the least imaginative, least appealing name that they call it in the US. But um, So this is actually made from isomalt, which is a fermented, um, uh, sugar alcohol from um, beet sugar that diabetics use because it doesn't give you the GI spike, right? It's actually optically clearer, so competitive pastry chefs use it, and it's a um, it's a delicious um, sweetener. Um, but what we do is actually, um, it when you ingest it, it actually acts like um, uh, a fiber. It's digested way down in your low gut, so effectively you're farming or cultivating your lower gut, right? Um, with, uh, um, and we then wrap it with uh, edible flowers, high nutrition value edible flowers, um, dust it with bee pollen, and, um, and put an LED wand in the middle um, to taste a biodiverse and healthy future. Exploring that. Okay, so that uh, will go off foods. We'll come back to foods in a minute. Um, I wanted to go back to um, some other cross-species adventures to see how we might think through a, uh, the infrastructure that we have in our urban context and how we might reimagine that to accommodate the diverse organisms that contribute to a healthy uh, eco urban ecosystem. Um, the recent project uh, took on the, the tragic phenomena of, uh, you know, the smear across that, the, of that butterfly smear um, that you have across your, your windscreen, right? The moths and butterflies, right? Um, <coughs> so this is um, a butterfly bridge which facilitates the safe crossing of um, the butterfly bridge is what it looks like is actually a bridge that, um, that has butterfly attracting plants in it. So the butterflies go from one habitat patch to another patch of habitat, bouncing along the top across the urban obstacle of, um, of roadways. Um, so um, <coughs> uh, to create a, 
you know, a superhighway of connected habitat patches that become much more viable for populations to thrive. There's also a salamander superhighway um, in Socrates Sculpture Park now, the Socratic salamander. You can um, uh, get tweets every time. It's basically a micro speed bump that uh, allows the salamanders to cross um, safely. Um, and uh, for those of you in the cars above, it's a, a little reminder, a little bim bim that we are not alone. But um, you can subscribe to tweets from the Socratic salamander, and every time the salamanders go through this, they, you know, say, you know, hi, honey, I'm coming home, right? They go um, update you on. Um, <clears throat> so this kind of, this is actually the salamander superhighway in place at uh, Socrates at the moment. Um, which is part of an exhibition recently opened there called Civic Action, um, where four artists were invited to develop urban plans for this really interesting chunk of New York City, Long Island City. Um, so my urban plan was called Up to You, Up being short for um, Urban Plan to You, um, obviously. Um, and, and one of the parts of the project is um, an exercise program um, the exercise program uh, that actually is not only for your personal health benefit, but also for your environmental health benefit. So people who sign up for the exercise challenge for uh, often a two-week or a four-week or a six-week challenge um, are given a, um, a personalized, you know, a personal training um, uh, route where they uh, do a number of exercises that all have you know, benefits for their own personal health, but they're, um, also the environment. So an example of one of them that um, we're going to launch tomorrow here in an exercise program is the uh, hula hoop. Um, here, you can see these hula hoops have, um, have been adapted. Um, so hula hoops are really great for core body conditioning. If you want a six pack, hula hooping is the way to get it, right? Um, but uh, so these hula hoops have been adapted with um, holes, you can see, and filled with, um, in the case of Long Island City, northeastern wildflower, perennial wildflowers. So as you hula hoop, you're spreading um, perennial resources for critical pollinators, reinforcing these. Um, and if anyone wants to come and demonstrate, there's a fully loaded one here, <coughs> maybe afterwards, or um, uh, this is taped over. Um, this is actually a fresh mix we've just brought from a uh, summer solstice event we had last night in Socrates Sculpture Park in New York. We thought we'd come and um, cross-pollinate, if you will, um, uh, spread some seed over here. So someone will demonstrate this for me after. Um, uh, so, um, of course, once you've hula hooped in your place, you know that that's where you're going to diversify the um, the resources for pollinators, you're much more likely to go back next week to see the effect you've had and the week after. And in fact, um, here we are loading the, um, the uh, hula hoops. There's, uh, your exercise pro program comes with a phenological diagram of when things bloom, what insects uh, uh, um, uh, um, will appear, um, what birds, so it actually you start to observe and um, annotate um, your experience of the natural cycles, the natural systems in which we are all involved. Um, so these animal interfaces, these explorations of how we can collaborate and um, <coughs> coordinate with our non-human um, neighbors, I class under a under this uh, title ooze, which is zoo backwards and without cages, right? So actually the Bronx ooze is an ongoing, an international project um, that's based in the Bronx River Art Center, which is a wonderful um, art center that I am involved with in the Bronx, in actually the poorest congressional district in the entire country. Um, and it's three blocks south of the Bronx Zoo, which, of course, is a wonderful institution, the Wildlife Conservation Society, but they spend a lot of time doing conservation work in Costa Rica and all over the world. But the coyotes that go down into Central Park that go right past, they don't do, they don't care about. So the urban, the non-human 
um, urban animals. Um, it's what ooze is actually developing habitat for um, and creating. But how do we kind of these um, uh, there's some, some less than charismatic organisms that we are really critical in our urban ecosystems. Um, and uh, for instance, um, insects and beetles, right? Um, not most people's favourites compared to koala bears or even, you know, seals or the whale in the Guanas Canal or the, uh, you know, three species of seals have set, settled into lower Hudson River, right? Um, this kind of phenomena of urban migration that when I went to school it used to describe the movement of rural poor people into urban centres and now of course describes the movement of animals formerly known as wild into urban centres and why? All right, this is uh, I know it, I know in Germany, um, in Karlsruhe, there was a really interesting case that I've been following about the wild ferrets moving in. They are very noticeable because they, they like to chew on brake cables, which um, has catastrophic um, <laughs> consequences. But, but uh, we see it all over the developed world as uh, animals are moving in, which testifies, I would argue, not only to the loss of habitat elsewhere, but that our... Uh, that every green space we create is an invitation for non-humans to cohabit, that our urban ecosystems are healthy and viable. Um, and um, anyway, let's keep going on that. Um, let's build on that. Um, this is a new sport I developed uh, a while ago um, to deal with one of the, well, I think, uh, a hero of the underworld. Um, does anybody know who the strongest animal in the world is? By a long shot. Ants. Most people think ants. They've had good PR, a good PR firm. I don't know why. But they are. They are 17. They can lift about 17 times there. Now, um, this organism that uh, is can lift about 36 to 45 times its weight. Um, it is the caterpillar, you know, in the yellow heavy lifting equipment of the of the uh, underworld. Um, it is the stag beetle or the rhinoceros beetle. Um, but interfacing with this has been a little bit difficult. I've been exploring how we might interface with non this, these beetles. Um, and I developed this sport called um, the rhinoceros, uh, rhinoceros beetle wrestling. So this is the um, head-mounted display um, in which you actually crawl into. Um, and it scales the human forces down to beetle scale and the beetle forces up to human scale to create a level playing field, if you will. Right? Visually it does the same, there's a little camera so the beetle appears um, huge in your, in your visual screen and you appear small to it. So, um, so in this way, um, you know, I take bets on man versus beast. Um, we score this in in, uh, it actually gets quite violent. This is a uh, we um, uh, because this is amplified. We're using um, powerful forces that can really throw. I had I threw my shoulder out. I've had several people um, injured. I usually challenge the icons of masculinity to uh, to take on the beast um, and then take wages of. Um, so that's how I fund this. Anyone wanting to make a bet on <laughs> um, the beast or the uh, man is welcome to. Um, <coughs> so again, this idea that, uh, let me go back to the um, beetle, the idea that we can develop a sport, you can imagine as a vastly sport, uh, as a high school sport, and I actually am offering scholarships to my program at the Environmental Health Clinic for rhinoceros beetle wrestling champion, right? But um, you can imagine that if we had a rhinoceros beetle wrestling sport, in which, of course, we depended on rhinoceros beetle being, actually have to be a little raunchy to really want to wrestle. So you have to have the females nearby to excite the males into aggressive behavior. Um, you know, we know that formula. Um, and you have to have, you know, uh, habitable areas for them, of course, you can imagine that all those toxic turf that we've dedicated to soccer fields and football fields and hockey fields and um, you know if there's little uh, if those these tr you know, why are they so strong is because they churn the that rhizomic sphere that cellulosic material 
they, uh, they uh, increase the soil biodiversity. They could transform those toxic turf, that toxic turf into, you know, biodiverse, healthy soil systems in a season, right? Had we, um, if we can get behind this as a, um, as a sport. So this kind of consequences of exploring how we might um, play with um, ideas of, of sport um, and actually rediscover the sport in transport, which I'll go on to next. But first of all, I wanted to introduce you um, and invite you all to um, another project in the Socrates Sculpture Park right now that we've just opened called the Tree Office. Um, and the tree office is what it, uh, it sounds like. It's a, it's a co-working space in a tree. Um, um, and this is based on, in fact, I just have some pictures that I... Um, this is the tree office um, <coughs> that I just brought. I'll just flip through some of them. Um, a tree office is a co-working space in a tree. Just as it, as it looks, I'm... I'll come back. Where was I? Um, and this is based on the idea that, uh, um, well, actually, there's a there's a legal precedence for this. I've declared, and part of as part of the up to you urban plan, that the trees own themselves and the property they stand on, which is an idea that um, this guy had in 1848 in Athens, Georgia. Um, where he decided he loved this white acorn tree that he'd grown up with, and so he he willed it to itself and the property it stood on, and um, and he just did it right. And then then the, unfortunately the tree died, um, and they planted an acorn of the tree on the same uh, little eight foot by eight foot area of land, and that tree grew. So heritability laws were tested, and this stands as a precedent for. Uh, tree that owns itself, and you can go and visit it. I think it's auspicious that it's a in Athens, Georgia, but um, the seat of kind of where democracy um, has been imagined before. And how we might build on uh, the recent Bolivian declaration that the earth has rights, that we can extend rights discourse to, to organisms, to ecosystems, and that that is what we might do. So this is an exploration of that. Um, by creating, so it's, a, it's nice, okay. Um, by contrast, urban forestry has been motivated by this idea that uh, you know, a tree over the value of its life is worth somewhere between 200 and $400 in the environmental services it provides and air cleaning and sequestering carbon and habitat. I mean, Two hundred to four hundred dollars dollars over its lifetime. All right, that's the service worker. That's the environmental services approach that goes into the cost-benefit analysis of urban planners in current times. Right, it doesn't really make sense to me. It doesn't reflect the value. Um, so, but as a tree office. It works much better. So anyone can book a time to, um, you know, uh, desk space in this. It actually, there's a $10 day pass where you can go and work there. It's a great place to finish your thesis or that, um, you know, um, play or write songs. Or It's just a stretching views of Manhattan um, and uh, pleasant and, and delicious and much more pleasant than most of the other co-working spaces. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and of course, your landlord is that there's local power. We um, it produces its own power from a micro hydro turbine in the East River, and it actually acts as a an ISP, an internet service provider, and a Wi-Fi tower. We use the tree itself as an antenna, so um, high-speed internet um, as well. Um, so that's actually in collaboration with um, the Free Wireless Group. So the tree you pay your dues. Your, your tree is your landlord, right? Um, and uh, and in, we're actually doing aerial yoga uh, classes under the tree as well. So again, has anyone done anti-gravity yoga? It's really fantastic. But you pay your yoga fees to the tree. And what does the tree do? You know, it's exercising its its property rights, right? It's exploiting its its own property. What does the tr tree do with its revenue? People have been asking. Well, of course, it spends it in its own interests, um, augmenting its soil with biochar, uh, companion planting, and sending its um, 
uh, its offspring to college. We have a little project where the um, saplings are being taken to Cornell University and to NYU and to other places where they'll be planted and propagated. Because this organism, like all of us, um, we have the same interests. Um, and the parks department that, you know, are, uh, normally would, um, I don't, don't seem to, to realize this. So um, anyone who'd like to, uh, an office space in New York City for this summer, you're invited to come and work in the tree office. Another project in, um, in Socrates is the Moth Cinema, which is a, um, a very, um, <clears throat> an exploration of how we might rethink uh, night lighting and the carnage that every light um, provides to the, these valuable moths, night flying insects, who of course provide tremendous pollination and environmental services. Um, so this is a light that goes on at night, uh, illuminating the park, um, illuminating a silver screen. Um, and it shines over a moth garden that I planted um, so that the uh, nightly dramas, the love triangles, the fluttering lifestyles of the dark and mysterious moths are uh, played out on the silver screen. Um, and uh, of course testifies to the success we have of attracting and accommodating these um, uh, valuable insects. Um, so. The Moth Cinema is screening each night at Socrates as well. I invite you to um, come along and meet some of the new stars, um, the uh, Lunar Moth, the Polemius, um, and some of the others that we've attracted to this um, facility. Um, <clears throat> we've also launched the Long Island City of a project called Pharmacy um, to address the um, issue, perhaps that I started off with, asthma being the number one um, issue in our um, pediatric population. Um, um, and the idea that we have food systems and food distribution systems that degrade our health. It just, you know, that give kids asthma and compromise all of our why, right? Pharmacy is a project to actually explore how we might do this a little bit differently. Um, and it's based on the charge of pharmacy is to not only reduce the negative damage of our food systems, right, to reduce the pesticides, to reduce the, um, the food miles, to reduce the um, amount of petrochemical fertilizers, which is all good. And the food movement is, um, you know, I would argue the biggest social movement in the world um, currently. Um, pharmacy is really an exploration how can we do urban agriculture where we're not reduplicating rural agriculture, but in fact exploring how we can produce delicious edibles viably in an urban context, but increase biodiversity, augment our environmental health, improve air quality. So that's, um, to do that we've developed this little ag bag, which I have um, many of them several of them here, and I'll be doing an ag bag workshop tomorrow um, to which you're all invited. The ag bag is what it looks like, a simple Tyvek uh, bag that hangs over any railing or double hung window or parapet to create arable territory out of thin air. Right, Tyvek you'd be familiar with from, you know, those, the, when you go to concerts and you get a Tyvek band or your Tyvek FedEx envelopes, right? Incredible tensile strength incredibly in inexpensive. It's waterproof, but it breathes. So it allows us to, uh, unlike a, a flower box, right, which if it falls, from even from the second floor, it can, it's catastrophic, it can kill people, right? In the worst case, uh, first and foremost, these are safe in that they require no destructive fixturing. They can't fall and, uh, you know, at worst you could maybe slice them with a knife and they would sprinkle down some growing medium and you know there's no catastrophic failure mode. So the way it works is actually to demonstrate closed system agriculture because even in permaculture and um, many of our um, organic farming methods we are still degrading the watershed right by tilling the, the soil. In this case it's waterproof, and of course the first question is, well, where does it drain? How does it drain, right? And so we have in our ag bags a 
polyacrylamide gel, which is similar to anyone who's wearing the uh, same gel that you've had in your contact lenses, or in the diapers of uh, nappies of babies, right? Uh, it expands to 400 times its size, and it pulls the water out of the soil, uh, where it stores it and sort of distributed micro reservoirs throughout the growing area, and then releases it back into the soil when the um, when the uh, soil is dry enough, when the osmotic pressure is dry enough. And then the question is, of course, well, what do you grow in an urban context? You know, the big criticisms of urban agriculture are, well, in the case of New York City, oh, well, you know, yield, right? You can't grow enough for it to be significant. Well. I would argue that the second criticism is that um, why invest in urban agriculture when you know you're seven miles up the Hudson you've got Rockland County where family farms are being sold for fracking rights because they can't penetrate the you know why not just invest in rural struggling rural communities right and there's I would argue of course you do and you coordinate between this so this the ag bag is not for growing tomatoes and basil and typical um, rurally produced things. It's actually for exploring new urban foods, foods that are high nutrition value, high commercial value, highly perishable, non-distributable goods, right? Not competing with rural uh, farmers, but developing a new palate. So black pansies, for instance, um, you have to use them within a couple of minutes of picking them. Otherwise, their delicate volatiles disappear right? Um, nasturtions, those of you who know, they sell at five dollars a punnet, about a dollar a flower, right? They're lovely peppery flowers. The colour, the high potent colour of, of um, flowers signals high nutrition value, right? The um, high lycopenes, high, these powerful antioxidants that the urban body that's assaulted with contaminants all the time really needs, right? So these, um, these Edible flowers, I would argue, is one way to explore a delicious, tasty, urban agriculture. Um, the, uh, the black pansies, for instance, are very good when you flash infuse them into vodka straight away with um, black pansy vodka is to die for. Um, but um, there's many other recipes we've, developing, we've been developing. But the other, um, the other parameter, of course, is um, a high shoot to root ratio. So you don't have much root space in an urban context. Um, you also have you know, contaminated soil in most cases. Um, hydroponics is an energetic dead end for those of you, um, you know, who want to. We really need to understand how to build soil resources. Um, so we work a lot with biochar, which um, I'll talk to you in a, about uh, in a minute. But the, um, uh, but the, one of the, con one of the problems in Baltimore where they've done a lot of raised bed urban agriculture um, because of the contaminated soil is that you know, they've trucked in um, tons of nice loamy organic soil um, into Baltimore um, for these um, community gardens and urban agriculture initi initiatives. And what they've found that within two years that urban soil is contaminated, as contaminated as the um, as the soil beside it, right? So, um, so th this is one of the reasons why we prevent the deposition of urban air pollutants into the soil in the ag bags and create a, a very water efficient context in which to grow. But of course, then we're looking at how to um, plants that produce a high uh, leaf area index high shoot to root ratio um, as our fundamental um, plants. So this is, this is the berry farm that we launched in, in, um, at um, Postmasters Gallery last season, for which I got a class one violation from the Department of Buildings. To, to have to go to, that's what they give construction firms when they kill people, when cranes drop on people, they give them class one violations. So I got a class one violation for this and had to go to building. Department of Building Court um, because there was no permit that was applied to it. And I asked them what permit would I apply for and they said, we don't know, there isn't a permit. <laughs> but um, I was still fined, not the amount. And in fact, the way that we're proceeding with this is to the permit that best applies is the permits um, that are granted for advertising. 
So um, signage advertising. Um, uh, so this is looks like urban agriculture, vertical urban agriculture. It's actually advertising. So what is advertising? It's up to you to um, interpret. So in, a, in essence, this, this pharmacy project based on the ag bags creates the opportunity for distributed urban agriculture where small um, uh, territory is created and we're creating leaf area index. And that's the only technology, the only demonstrated technology for improving urban air quality, right? It's the only technology we have, fortunately. It's really in inexpensive and widespread. And if we take seriously this you know, integrating vegetation back into the urban um, context, we um, might explore how to do this. This is Doni, who's one of the U farmers or urban um, urban farmers, who has an ag bag on her her um, railing. Um, and you'll see here that there's actually a calendar system around here, where the um, at January through December, so when things bloom is marked in, on there when they leaf out, when an insect visits, when a bird visits. She was instructed just to annotate it on, on there. So I have the same thing on um, most of the ag bags, except the one, I think there's one up in, um, yeah, I, I don't have them on there. I've been doing, um, this is urban agriculture while repelling, but it's, um, uh, Anyway, in this case, what uh, I in mine, I actually have all my Google Calendar, all my grant deadlines uh, marked on there as well, um, and and I find it much more pleasant to look at than my Google Calendar um, as a uh, a way to understand my uh, life in the context of urban um, ecosystems, um, and of course that gives us really good data on the most sensitive indicator of climate change that we have, or climate destabilization we have, which is when things bloom, phenological um, outcomes. Um, and do they bloom differently on the second floor versus the 14th floor? It took 15 minutes for three different types of insects to find my ag bags on the 14th floor of my um, apartment building. Right, to understand the presence of non-human organisms. And to break, actually, the interesting thing from the nature culture divide is because Tyvek is like paper, it invites us to write on it, to annotate on it, it gives in situ notes in which you have intimacy with it. This is, you're more intimate with these plants than even the ones in your backyard, right? Because they're there in your window, in your railing, you see them every day, you annotate them. So it's, um, it gives us really high resolution, reliable data and it breaks that nature culture divide, right? We're in the park, you don't, you might have a placard that says the name of the tree, if that, right? Writing and nature, culture and nature are kept at odds. Whereas uh, the idea that we live inside natural systems, that nature isn't out there or isn't in little boxes we call parks, it's in the air we're breathing now, in our food systems, it is where we're at is um, exemplified by this approach. Um, we also have real-time uh, monitoring published on COSM and Patch Bay. Um, and uh, this is the vertical urban plot we have currently in, um, in um, Socrates. I'll just quickly now go um, fi finish, finish with a few projects in reimagining urban mobility um, and rediscovering the sport in transport. Um, and this is a um, project also launched as part of the Up To You plan, um, the Bike Messenger project, which depends on POV displays, on point of um, persistence of vision displays on your bicycle wheel. These are um, 126 LEDs that as you get to about five miles an hour, they stabilize into an image. And we've been curating and creating a number of indicators that I call occupies for the wheels of these um, these uh, bikes. Um, the first one we've been develop developing is on traffic fatalities, so that as you ride through a particular intersection, the fatalities at that intersection are displayed on your wheel. Right, so this is real-time geolocated information that's in situ. It's where you can make sense of it, where you can use it, where you can act on it, where you can use it. Um, uh, so. Um, this is a project in development. As you ride past um, along the East River um, bike ride or up the Hudson River, the organisms that are 
uh, um, they appear on the wheels. The aquatic organisms that are unseen appear on your wheels. Or as you p go past um, manufacturing facilities, the emissions from that manufacturing facility can be displayed on your wheels. This is emissions taken from the how stuff is made and how it can change database that I've been building with my students for the last 10 years. Um, so um, these are a ways, in, um, <clears throat> one way. In situ, public information display, I think, takes many forms. This is a quick introduction to the One Trees project, which is not one tree, it's actually um, 100 genetically identical trees that were micropropagated as, um, as sort of the stem cells of, of um, trees, adventitious tissue, and grown, um, and then planted in pairs in different micro microclimates around the San Francisco Bay Area. So you can see the within pair difference and the between pair difference. I planted these trees about 10 years ago, and you can see one pair here. Um, on Valencia Street and 22nd, where these are genetically identical trees in the same environment, right? This is um, same solar exposure. They look incredibly different. You can see the difference, right? Genetically identical in identical environmental conditions. What's going on? So I've been trying to make sense of all of the trees, but this pair had actually had me um, stumped so to speak, for a while. Um, and a uh, construction worker that I uh, kept seeing me coming back, kind of figuring out these trees, I was thinking that one of them must have gotten into a, um, into a water mains. Um, and that's why it was so much bigger. But as it turns out in San Francisco, quite charmingly, they, you know, in the shaky um, seismic uh, area of San Francisco, they use terracotta pipes for all their water mains. And so, of course, they're all cracked and leaking. Um, and they have tremendous losses. Uh, so they subsidize the entire urban forest with um, their, which is, I think, quite charming. So anyway, so there wasn't any differential about that. But I, um, but this construction worker said, to, you know, I explained to him the project and why I couldn't work out what was going on with these trees. And he said, well, look behind them. I hadn't looked behind them before. But um, one had a Victorian house behind it, you can just see. The big one has a Victorian house behind it, and the little one has a little 1950s um, structure behind it. And he said, well, you know, what happened between those two was the 1901 earthquake. Duh, I said, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, he said, well, that means that, you know, foundations have changed, building code changed since then. So what you're seeing is, you know, probably a massive bonsai. The foundations of the Victorian are not there, and they are for the, you know, the, the access to subsoil that the trade. So this is the most believable explanation I've gotten, and I work with a lot of soil scientists and um, interesting arborists uh, looking at, you know, deposition on leaves and all sorts of things. And I give you that example because this came from a construction worker. These complex socio-ecological systems are irreducibly complex, right? That's, of course, an obvious statement. Um, complex systems are complex. But the, um, but the idea that we can draw on the collective intelligence, the diversity of each one of us, recognize different things to make sense of these um, socio-ecological systems is what I'm illustrating with this project um, and with that, um, that anecdote about this project. Um, so then finally into, um, into sort of the opportunity that I have for reimagining our urban mobility. Um, and most of us know, I just flew here uh, a few hours ago. Uh, most of us know that the single most damaging thing we do as individuals is fly. Um, and we're racked with guilt about it. But we have actually a really interesting opportunity to reimagine flight. Um, the FAA recently created a whole new class of aircraft and a new pilot's license in the US and in Australia. Um, I th I'm not sure about German status yet. UK is not in yet, but the flight, um, the sport pilot license is um, you can 20 hours and you can fly, right? Anyone have a pilot's license? It's easier to get a pilot's license in New York than it is to get a driver's license actually now. So, um, so this gives us an opportunity to really think about 
flight again, right? And to understand flight systems. So in our flight systems, um, just to give you a quick introduction to them, most of our engineering innovation energy has been spent on thrust systems, right? The fuels and the efficiency. Now, the aircraft industry has been has improved about 1% efficiency every year for the past 50 years. If the um, vehicle industry had done the same thing, we'd be in a very different place. Um, they're, uh, they're, we've done a lot of incremental work in making planes efficient. Um, and surprisingly, the ecological footprint of the catering services on your average commercial airliner is larger than that of the thrust systems and the fuel for you know, most airliners, commercial airliners, you have about 80 trucks servicing it. All of those different plastics and the distribution of all that, uh, those terrible meals that you get on you know, <laughs> have this enormous cost. But by far the most, um, the biggest ecological footprint is the, is the landing infrastructure. Because we built all our, our um, we built all our airports, almost without exception, on cheap, flat swamps that were proximal to cities. And now we call them wetlands, right? Biodiversity hotspots, these critical ecosystems that... Um, so it's a landing infrastructure that we really need to reimagine. Um, so I've developed these wet landings, which are 700 foot long wet landings for... Um, I organized a little um, promo a couple of years ago with the US Airways landing in that little wet landing we call the Hudson River. You remember that? <laughs> you know, you never have to level a wet landing. Um, and of course, you can create them as biodiversity hotspots to create habitat for amphibians and um, other things. You can also refurnish them because most of us don't imagine hanging out in um, wetlands. So that's actually the heads down display, which is part of this furniture range for wetlands. Which got a heads way down display and a heads down display and uh, bird study, um, new forms of furniture for inhabiting um, wetlands. And then of course, for those of you who need a prosthetic for your imagination, um, we have this strap-on flight simulator, which is a, um, a, you know, allows you to appropriate your car as a portable wind tunnel and to explore the, these different biomimetic wings, these different aerofoils, to see which actually gives you more lift, stability, um, maneuverability, etc. So here's some um, actually squadron training um, where people are um, <clears throat> exploring the angle of attack, the maneuverability, right? This is more transferable into actual pilot and flight skill than your computer-based simulator. I will bet you 25 cents. Um, or, um, it, you know, if you, um, there's actually, we have a little iPhone app. You can say you have a strap-on black box, if you will, so you can put your iPhone out the, the window of the car as well, and that uh, logs the three axis acceleration changes, and you can upload your flight log to compare um, with other, other people to really kind of regain the wonder of flight. And the opinion that, uh, you know, why do, why do all those seabirds have those pointed wings, right? And birds of prey have those big, flat, shovel-shaped wings, right? Opinions of once you've explored that, you don't need to be an aeronautical engineer with computational, computational fluid dynamics to have a visceral understanding of how lift works. So once you've done this, you can um, actually then strap on 16-foot wingspan wings and practice your wet landings, which we did in the San Jose Biennial. Um, and then more recently in um, Toronto, which like um, New York City, 60% of the traffic fatalities are not cyclists, nor motorcyclists, nor drivers. 60% of pedestrians in uh, um, urban centers. Um, uh, so um, in Toronto, um, we think, you know, we did a project called Flight Path Toronto. I did this in collaboration with Usman Haq. Um, and um, for Nuit Blanche, we, th we flew hundreds of people through downtown um, Toronto over Nathan Phillips Square past City Hall. Um, you had to go through flight school, um, which was uh, to earn your autopilot license, which of course you sign yourself. Um, you uh, rigged up. Um, actually, uh, 
most, our biggest demographic was grandmothers. They were the most enthusiastic flyers. Kids weren't allowed to fly, interestingly, um, and grandmothers did with uh, um, incredible glee. Um, <laughs> but then you, uh, um, after you came out of flight school, you had one last chance to kind of try on your wings to get the feel for it. So these are not zip lines that are about, you know, fear and speed and height, but are about manoeuvring in the fluid dimension of air in the 3D space of our urban context. So after you graduate from flight school, you strap on your wings and then you fly across um, Nathan Phillips Square. Actually, there's sound to this somewhere. So I, I might keep that running um, to show you actually a couple of other things about it. Um, the, um, in this case, um, instead of having a flight tower, uh, which is typically, you know, a private conversation between the flight controllers and the pilot or the flyers. Um, and our uh, flight tower was inverted, um, and the inverse of a um, panopticon. In fact, it was the whoops of the crowds that actually lifted up those laser walls that you went smashing through as you were flying through, so um, people could participate. In fact, everybody participated in this project. Um, even whether they flew or not, right? What we were doing was creating a spectacle, a shared memory of a possible future, right? And that now cr changes what is possible. The kids who couldn't fly actually formed a coalition, the Zipline to School Coalition, and argued, you know, it's safer than, than walking, for instance, or riding a bike, and, and, um, and the kind of getting beyond the bike lane in urban discourse about um, more radical, playful, enjoyable, wondrous ways to move through um, urban contexts was um, what we were exploring here. So we can keep playing. It's a... Uh, anyway, there, a little bit of speed up. Okay. Um, look, Ma, no hands. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, so this actually has led to the final project I'll ask you to, to finish off with um, into vertical transportation um, and electric vehicles, um, the most common of which we all um, use and participate in um, elevators, right? Um, Long Island City, where the Socrates Sculpture Park is and the Up To You urban plan is based, is, um, if you don't know it, uh, interesting... Um, well, the biggest asset is that it, it's in a face-off with Manhattan. So there's this magnificent stretching view of the arguably one of the most charismatic skylines in the world. The problem is you can't see it from anywhere, right? So, um, so it's fairly low-rise um, commercial residential development where we've decided to upgrade the elevators in, in conspiracy with Otis with their, uh, their Gen 2 elevators are about 75% more efficient just off the shelf. Um, but what we do is extend the building an extra 30% and, um, so that the, uh, you produce the view of uh, Long Island City, um, right? But you also produce um, more opportunity for regenerative braking so that the elevator becomes uh, energy positive, a micro power plant for the building, right? You've also put a big glass box on top of a building, which means the greenhouse effect, right? Um, it heats up. You vent that out, and that pulls air through the building, and that 30% head is calculated, in fact, to replace your standard HVAC system. In New York City, about 80% of the CO2 is building-related. Much of that is HVAC systems. And in this case, we are producing um, uh, a passive uh, ventilation system that can replace this, the biggest energy hog um, and, um, and, of course, produce access to the roof where we start to think about how to distribute goods um, and people in this way. So Tomcat Bakery, for instance, is uh, 76 trucks every morning 
deliver delicious artisanal airy bread all over New York City. 76 trucks worth of diesel fumes, those plumes delivered to Long Island City residents every morning, right? They're one of 25 commercial bakeries. Um, most of the others are bigger. But why do we distribute food so it compromises our cardiovascular health? Asthma Alley runs straight past Tomcat Bakery, which is three blocks from the water. The raison d'etre of New York City is on the water, right? It's seven times more efficient to distribute goods on the water than it is over land. And so you can zip line these goods down to, um, down to the uh, waterfront and uh, distribute them in a much more effective way. And therefore really start to imagine what a radically inexpensive, emissionless form of mobility. One, the maintenance and running costs of one diesel truck for Tomcat Bakery is more than the cost of um, implementing a zip line system that would remove all of those diesel fumes um, and start to address the real health issues that we face. So um, with that, I would like to uh, finish um, as, uh, you know, having shown you a kind of a slew of examples and explorations and public experiments that explore this work of reimagining our relationship to natural systems. And actually take the John Dewey approach, I would argue, John Dewey of the Dewey Decimal System, who um, whose idea that experiments were part of participatory democracy, that each and every one of us needed to experiment, right? That the experiments weren't just for professional scientists, that we all had to skeptically engage with what was possible. And so I would leave it uh, with you to consider what is possible, what can we do? Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions, if there are any, for Natalie. Yes, Bilal. <laughs> um, when or how? Um, uh, this is fairly recent work, the um, Socrates Sculpture Park work. This is, um, was, uh, the exhibition opened a couple of weeks ago. I, there are a couple of other projects in there that I'd love to show you on biochar. In fact, I'd love to talk to you about biochar. Um, there's a big red, there's a big, not a red X, big green X. Actually, I have some of it. Big green X in, in, um, in Socrates now. Um, you might be able to see, no. Um, biochar is, and the biochar barbecue is a, another um, project in there. Um, these are, I mean, I, I, will, I will tell you about it because I'm so excited about biochar and I have, bio, I have a big bag of biochar here. I'm very proud to have hand carried this as a mule all the way from um, New York City for my friends at, uh, out of Incendia who have been supplying me uh, my pushes in biochar. Biochar is very exciting. Um, and so in Socrates, we have a big X that um, we've put in the grass uh, where we've augmented the soil with biochar. Biochar is for waste to energy. Um, you know, it's taking any cellulosic waste um, and burning it in a process um, called pyrolysis that produces a gas, syngas, great for barbecuing, which is what the biochar barbecue is. Um, but, the, um, but then it produces the char uh, without um, CO2 emissions, actually. It produces a char that when you augment it into soil, um, we get about 40% increase in, in biomass production, greatly increases the microbial diversity, retains water better. It's a uh, complex um, phenomena that was archeologically discovered in the Amazon a practice that um, was lost about 1,500 years ago where they deliberately augmented the soil in this way. But the most exciting thing is that it takes waste, produces energy, uh, augments the soil, and then sequesters carbon for not a few hundred years like forests do, but the most conservative estimate is about um, a million years, right? So that's the type of 
time, 5,000 to a million years is the most conservative estimate. So I call the up to you plan the 5,000 year urban plan because that's the kind of time scale we, we can and need to think about. So people at Socrates, um, anyone you're invited to bring your um, cellulosic waste, actually junk mail, and burn it in the biochar barbecue to create a biochar char where we are um, exploring how to use this. So th these are all the urban plan is, is really to look at um, the multiple ways in which we do and can and must think of our urban um, ecosystems. Not, you know, through ownership structure of the, the trees, through, um, you know, what we do with our uh, junk mail, through these. Uh, so the multiplicity of the projects, I think, is in order to illustrate that this isn't a singular investigation in, you know, the particular algae that's going to be the best uh, biofuel. This is socio-ecological systems design, and it's fun, and, um, and we all need to be exploring and experimenting um, materially. So, um, so they're all fairly recent projects um, <laughs> to do with up to you. I'm very, I sort of, I feel a little embarrassed coming to, to Berlin, plonking down here, um, bringing this work, because I know so much great work is going on here in terms of urban agriculture and you know socio-ecological systems design. That um, that I hope this is the beginning of a of you know the cross fertilization and collaboration about the sort of many ideas that are swirling around um, and exploring what's possible. Another question? Yeah. How do they react? Um, I mean, I, 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 it's a hard question to answer. I mean, I suppose the big challenge for me is um, how do you structure participation? Because what I do, I think, is structure participation in what and how people feed animals, for instance, right? Um, so uh, it's not interaction design, but it's, you know, the granularity of participation. Um, and the thing that I've come to recently that has been very problematic to me is that the way that most people engage, I mean, coming into an art gallery, you don't really know what to do. In a, sculpt a sculpture park, you don't really know well, that's nice, right? It's, but so what, right? But when people can say, can I buy one? Right? That's a form of participation that, um, that we all, it's kind of a lingua franca, right? So being able to buy an ag bag turns out to be the most, that's what people want to talk about. Well, how much is it? And how do I get one? Or, you know, they're less interested in, um, you know, the lycopene value of nasturtium flowers or the, uh, you know, the, the, there's a way of engaging, I think, that is, you know, how do I build my tree office, right? That, um, so there's a kit now for tree offices that we're working with some legal theorists to, so I think that to your question, that's, that's actually the challenge that I face is sort of figuring out different ways where people can participate like, you know, working in the tree and experiencing, wow, oh, this is nice, right? I'd rather work here than in my office. And, oh, well, if it's, it's enjoyable, if it's something, I can, I can rethink of trees not as, you know, service workers providing environmental services, but as facilities and as, um, you know, have, give them a different legal status and my own intuitions is... Um, so these different ways to participate, I think, depend on uh, very different, but experiential ways to engage, to purchase, to participate, to taste, <coughs> to really um, viscerally experience possibilities. So I, I think it's fairly legible to, I mean, that's what I strive to be, is legible to very diverse people. Um, but, of course, the 
proof is always in the pudding. Um, and um, I'm interested in, in kind of learning what people do and don't get from it. In fact, that's why I use these participatory methods the most. With the one trees instrument, where all the trees are planted around the San Francisco Bay Area, I could have, you know, done the same experiment in my lab, right? With, you know, experimenting with different soil conditions and different light conditions, and but um, and it would have been a more controlled experiment. And what my colleagues politely or not so politely call the uncontrolled experiment of the um, of the uh, One Trees project. But I learned so much more from the construction worker and from the kids who noticed that birds like to land in one tree and not the other tree. And why is that? And sort of the observations that I would never have made myself, that I didn't go in looking for, that I think I learned from diverse, you know, the average person, you know, the diversity of people um, that makes public experiments the the medium in which I I find the most rewarding. Does that answer your question? Another one? Good. Up to you. <laughs> um, it is many of the projects, are, the way they're published are as invitations um, for them to be built on, reused, duplicated, um, contested, you know. Um, and, uh, and yeah, there's some wonderful collaborations. Project, older projects that I've done before have been you know, I've had time to percolate a little bit more. Have been um, no parks, for instance, which are little bioswales that transform no parking spaces into um, into infiltration opportunities, or other things. That I think are, are, are further along that line. But I, but that's I suppose the the test of putting these things out there. Uh, will there be another tree office? Will there be another zip line? Can I? You do? <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, uh, the, I can, I mean, I'm most pleased with the facade. I didn't show you much of the facade with the big X on it, which is transparent, but still, you know, it defines it without enclosing it um, and uh, is about building. Anyway, um, Fowl Studios designed that, Gavench. Um, it was a really lovely thing that we've got. We've got those. Um, plans published, you can do whatever pattern you like in them. But anyway, the idea that um, that's actually how we publish, uh, that's why we publish, as an invitation for other people to reuse, improve, you know, um, change what we've done um, and, you know, be part of the, the larger public experiment of, you know, what is, what can we do? What can we... How can this be done? So every single project is an invitation to participate from, you know, bringing your junk mail to, you know, seeing just how much more the grass grows in the bio in the biochar X where biochar marks a spot. And all of, they're all, yeah, um, invitations to participate. So are we done? So one final invitation to participate then is I do have um, a, I'm actually, in this case, I'm working for my son um, who's been running a lemonade stand 2.0 um, with open source cola, um, one of the um, food products we're selling at, um, at Socrates. Open source cola takes a, a leaked recipe from Coca-Cola that was leaked a few years ago. Um, and has um, been open sourced. Cube Cola, a great um, organization in Bristol, UK, have um, actually mixed it up for us and anyone can get the um, syrup, which is, when you look at the value, um, it's uh, orange oil, lemon oil, clove oil, there's about 15 different essential oils in it and you realize why Coca-Cola had a medicinal value um, before. Um, so I would invite you to taste some open source cola, which I'll pour out here, and to 
toast to um, your environmental health, to your health, your environmental health. And, um, and this is actually, I will warn you, has no sugar in it, which I think is the best way to actually experience the kind of floral dimension of open source cola. And I'll leave that as a final tongue-wetting invitation. Yes.